Uh, my name is Laura Richman. I, I actually did start off my career as a veterinary scientist. I still am a veterinarian. And I worked with elephants. And um, you may have heard, some of you who are old enough, that our baby elephant at the National Zoo just down the road died. And this was back in 1995, so it has been a while. And it was um, due to a mystery illness. And guess what? I got to solve it. And it's so cool now because we know it's a worldwide problem and it's a virus that has killed lots of elephants, but no one really asked those really important questions early on. And those questions are, why? Why did that elephant die? What caused it? And what can I do about it? So the one thing I want you to take away from here is don't think that we, all, we adults know all the answers because we don't. There's so many things we don't know, okay? But I wanted to start off and tell you a little bit about what I'm doing now and why I went from elephants to humans, because it's all science and it's all so cool. So the most important thing today that you're going to go home and tell your parents is that science is cool. Remember that. It's very cool. And not only is it cool, it's fun and it's thrilling in many cases. And if you really get into it, it's addicting. You'll love it. How many want to be scientists? Awesome, I love it. Hopefully, we're going to double the number of hands by the end, because you're going to see some really cool science. So I'm going to start off with a question to you. What is this? Just yell it out. Apple. Did anyone say anything other than apple? No, because a representation of an apple. Awesome, yeah, that's great. Yes, that's right. <laughs> But why didn't anyone say fruit? Because that would be true too, right? But you said apple, and I didn't hear anybody say, this is a red delicious apple, right? Why didn't you say that? Yeah? Because it's not a red. <laughs> well, it, so it is a red apple, that's for sure. There are other varieties of apples, right? So maybe a golden delicious, a golden apple, or uh, what else? Granny Smith, a green apple. Can you think of others? How about? Ah. Yeah, so there's all sorts of varieties. There are size differences. There's miniature apples, right? And then there's the rare apple. Have you ever seen those? No, it's very rare. <laughs> yeah, so the point with all this is that when you see something, don't take it as face value as that's the reason, okay? This is an apple. The first apple I showed you is an apple, but there may be a lot of complexity to that apple. There may be differences. And so all these varieties of apples are different. And then there's the rare variety, the blue apple. So I'm telling you this because I want you to look at this individual here. I'm going directly into human medicine now. And what's this guy doing? He's coughing, right? But do you know why he's coughing? He's sick? So you made an assumption, right? You said this guy's coughing, he must be sick. Oh, maybe he has a cold. So thinking back to that apple example, right? I don't know if he has a cold. Maybe he's choking. Maybe he just came from a smoke-filled room or a fire. I don't know. But until I ask what he's doing and why he's doing it, I won't know the answer, OK? So what are the causes of cough? Some of you know. You know there are, go ahead and just spill it out. Yeah, just yell it out. Yes. Right? Asthma, viruses, colds, yeah? So you guys are so smart, you know all of this, right? Yeah, so it turns out, after we've done some diagnostics, and we, we talk to this guy, and we ask him about his symptoms, and we do some testing, we do some blood testing and such, we've determined this guy has asthma, okay? And asthma can cause coughing and wheezing, Anybody know, have asthma or know people who do? And, and yeah, so what, what happens when people have asthma? Yeah, they have difficulty breathing, right? It's really hard to catch their breath. They have an asthma attack, they start coughing. And the reasons for that asthma attack actually are quite different. Many, many different types of asthma, okay? Some people, their asthma is triggered by things like exercise, so they'll go running a mile at school. You guys run PE, yeah? And then they'll start coughing and wheezing. I actually used to do that myself. Some people, their asthma is triggered by things like cold, cold environment. Then they start wheezing. You can't, can't catch your breath. 
Some people, it's inflammation triggered by things like allergies, pollen in the atmosphere. Come this time of year, it's, it gets really bad. But until we act, actually ask those questions of this patient, we know, won't know the cause, and then importantly, we won't know how to treat it. And treatments can be very specific for different causes. Okay? There are treatments that are symptomatic treatments, such as inhalers. So you've seen people that have an asthma attack, and they'll take that inhaler and take a breath, and that'll give them some relief. But it's not treating the underlying disease. It's just giving them some relief so they can breathe. Okay? If I want you to imagine somebody with asthma. They have you know, their airways, their bronchioles and bronchi, that come down through the, the trachea into the lungs. That's where the air goes in and out. If you have asthma, I want you to imagine that it's a straw that you're breathing through instead of this nice big windpipe. So imagine breathing in and out of a straw that's getting smaller and smaller. That's scary, right? Yeah? And you can imagine why that causes a lot of anxiety in people. But there's lots of reasons that that straw gets narrower and narrower. In some cases, it fills up with stuff like mucus and gunk like that. In some cases, it's inflammation, so it's white blood cells that accumulate in that airway. And in some cases, there's some muscle, smooth muscle, around the outside of the airway that constricts and it spasms. So until we really p examine this patient in, in greater detail, we won't know. Okay? So this is what we're doing, you know, where I work at MedImmune, we, we ask these questions about the different types of diseases people have. So in this case, in asthma, what you're looking at here is a see-through man, yeah, you can see through his chest into his lungs, and those red big things are the lungs. And I've actually put these nice big cells on top of it, of course, cells aren't really this big, they're microscopic and you can't see them with your naked eye, but for Beautiful pictures today, I put them much bigger. There are cells that can accumulate in the lung, around the airways, inside the airways, that can block that airflow, okay? And in some cases, we've determined that the, the types of cells that accumulate can pr probably cause the asthma attack. And how they do that is they actually release some granules. I'm gonna show you in a cartoon format kind of what they do. So I've taken that red cell, um, in this case, it's an eosinophil. Have you ever heard of it? eosinophil, which is one of the white blood cells? Yeah. Eosinophils are bad players in asthma. They're, they're the bad guys. And what they do is when they get triggered by things like pollen or there's a variety of things that can trigger them, they release their granules. Okay? Their granules come out, come out and they cause fluid to build up in the lungs and mucus and things like that. Inside each of those granules are things called mediators or types of proteins that cause this to happen. So until we understood that this cell type was a bad player and we needed to get rid of it, we didn't know what to go after, right? Everyone was just taking inhalers. But now that we know that eosinophil is probably a cell we don't want, we can design a drug to attack that cell. Okay. So one of the important questions to ask early on is, what is unique about that cell that's not on other cells in the body? Because if you're trying to kill one cell or a bad player, you don't want to kill all the cells in your body, right? That would be really bad. So we really have to study these cells in great detail to understand what's unique about it and how to get rid of it. So that's just one example of really the personalized approach for medicine that we're, we're um, working on. It's all about asking individual questions of the patient. You've heard of cancer, right? Cancer is, if you've ever heard of somebody who's had cancer, it's a scary diagnosis. The questions, no matter what disease we're talking about, the questions are always the same. What, what's wrong with this person? What, what type of disease do they have? Well, in this case, we're, we're talking about cancer, okay? Why do they have cancer? That's a, that's a really good question. There's a lot of complexity to cancer. There's lots of different reasons we think people get cancer. Genetics is one of them. We think that certain genes can um, actually make a person more susceptible to cancer. But more importantly, we need to understand how to treat cancer. And until we understand those cell types again that are responsible for the cancer, it's gonna be hard to treat.
See these two girls? Yeah? They're twins. Is that obvious? Yeah. Yeah. This is Janet and Sandy. Actually, the woman on the left is Janet. She was my college roommate, so I know her very well. Even though they look alike, they're actually dizygotic twins. So they came from two different eggs. Um, they are very much the same in, in many different ways. However, their, their genetics, the, the, the makeup of their genes is different because they're two different individuals. They didn't come from the same egg. Janet has had cancer. Janet is on the left. Sandy has not. But on top of that, their lifestyles are very different. Janet never had children, and not that that matters, but Sandy has. Janet's never worked in her life. Sandy has. So there's a lot of different influences in her life. Did any one of those make a difference in, their, in her cancer diagnosis? Uh, it's hard to say. But these are the types of things we need to study, is lifestyle, environment, genetics, to understand why certain people get cancers and, and certain people don't. So cancer's scary. I understand that uh, you know, most everybody, by the time they're my age, knows of individuals who've been affected by cancer or have had cancer themselves. I just wanted to talk a little bit about what cancer is so you understand it. Cancer is just uh, what, what happens in your body when a normal cell goes haywire, okay? It starts dividing and replicating itself uncontrollably. And so what you're seeing here is a cancer cell that's dividing. And on top of that, it's not just making more of itself. It gets really ugly and scary. So as you can see, those pseudopods or those arms that are coming off the, the cell at the bottom, this is what the cancer cell does. It, it reaches out and tries to find w ways to get into other body parts, okay? So it migrates out of its normal environment and it sends out these arms and it divides all at the same time. And so what happens down the road is that once it gets bigger and it finds ways of getting into the blood vessels, so these red tubes are the blood vessels, it can migrate out of, the, of the, its normal environment where it started and go to a distant site. And this is what we call metastasis. You've heard of that, right? Yeah. So this is what, how cancers spread. And you can hear that you, if certain individuals have a primary tumor that has spread to other locations, that's, that's harder to treat because it's already spread. Okay? So that's a metastasis. So with that little um, introduction into what cancer is, I'm going to need some help. And oh my gosh, interestingly, my elementary school volunteers all at the same time. So um, I'd like you to come over here onto my right. Okay. And volunteer number one. Um, so what is your name? Walter. No, it's not. What's your name? Volunteer number one. No. You are Dr. Awesome. Okay, so you read your name tag. You are Dr. Awesome. Here you go. There you go. Okay. Volunteer number two. What's your name? Set. Set. No, it's not. Volunteer number two. <laughs> Here, put this on. Dr. Incredible. Yay, Dr. Incredible. Okay. Volunteer number three. Ryan. Oh, come on. You can be creative. No, I can't. <laughs> okay, he's um, Dr. Spectacular, how about that? Okay, so um, I'm going to need some help because we need to rationally design some drugs to kill our cancer cell. And here in front of us we have a cancer cell, okay? And what you might notice right off is this cancer cell is really ugly because it has all of these things sticking up. And potentially a normal cell wouldn't have all of these things sticking up, okay? These are different proteins on the cell that we could potentially attack and then kill the cancer cell, okay? And the key for personalized medicine is to understand what's different about this cancer cell and that's not on normal cells, that we can kill this one and not normal cells, okay? All right, so I have a variety of drugs and I would like you to try to help me kill this cancer cell. And for the people in the audience still, you guys can look here, we have um, a concept I'd like you to think about as you're doing this. Really to understand that cancer cells, in their unique way, have epitopes that we can attack. It's kind of like a lock and a key. There's specific things that we can do to kill a cancer cell that won't kill normal cells, okay? 
Um, and in a more pictorial uh, approach, you can see that there's uh, monoclonal antibodies, again, that we can use to design to hit different epitopes on the cancer cell, okay? So I would like you to come up and grab some monoclonal antibodies. Okay? You can come pick and see um, if you're gonna be able to do this. Now, this is very tough, actually. Um, there's gonna be uh, a winner and some losers. <laughs> but this is also a good lesson because drug design is very difficult. And in some cases, you think that you have been very smart in the way you've, you've designed a drug, but then it doesn't work. And then you have to go back to the drawing board and figure out why. So, my three doctors here, can you please attempt to kill this cancer cell? Okay, go, go ahead. Oh, oh my gosh, okay, so one, one guy, but guess what? This cancer cell, there's something that happens. It builds up resistance. And so sometimes a drug will work and then it won't. So if you have to start over, build another one. Okay, oh, see, it's, it's very tough. Ah, we got another winner here, great. And so the point about this is that drug design, rational drug design is not easy. It's a lot of trial and error, but hypothesis driven. And we need more people like these guys to, to join us in our quest to understand cancer and other important diseases and um, design drugs to help us through. And as these guys are working on it, <laughs> It's, um, I wanted to let you know this is going to be at the festival, which happens over the weekend. You can come play with it yourself. And we also have a giant nose you can reach into and pull out some things and learn about the body's immune system and flu and things like that. So, um, all right, guys. Very good job. Thank you for <laughs> trying to cure my cancer cell. Um, give them a round of applause, everyone. <laughs> And so um, with that, I wanted to leave you with a message um, again that no matter what science we're talking about, no matter what disease we're trying to fight, no matter what species, whether it be an elephant or humans, we have the concept again that science is for health this time. It's cool and it's for health and it's for your health and my health. So we need really brilliant scientists to join our quest. <laughs>